Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter and Dr. Sean Baker. Sean is a strength and high intensity athlete and coach, setting personal records into his 50s. Zach is an endurance coach and athlete who competes for the S Fuels and Ultra Footwear Extreme Endurance teams. Together, Zach and Sean bring you a wide range of topics with guests from around the world. Topics include health, nutrition, physical fitness, and sports. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit paypal.me forward slash hpopod or patreon.com forward slash hpopodcast. If you wish to sponsor the show, please reach out to us at hpopodcast at gmail.com. The links to all of these can be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform or for the video versions of the show, head over to YouTube and search Human Performance Outliers Podcast. If you enjoy a show, please consider sharing with your friends and family on social media. Now, on to the next topic. Albuquerque in November, and I've really come to, uh, I don't know him well, but from visiting with him there and then seeing all the people he hooks up with and the things he's thinking, I, I really, I enjoy quite a lot what he's what he has to say, you know, what he's doing. So, yeah, we've had. It sounds him. like you guys have interacted quite a lot. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I, he's he 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 gets us guest ideas, and he's a, he's a he, you know he's very passionate about uh, about sort of this this aspect of uh, food, um, and so uh, and, and we are too. We're we're trying to learn and try to get the information out there. And so it's always wonderful to talk to uh, different people in that space. Fred, if you don't mind, there are people, and I know we, I know you guys talk about it off recording, but we're on record now. Um, can you give us a little bit of your background just so people know your background, where you're coming from before we get into the discussion? Is that okay? Sure. I'm happy to do that. And I'm going to step back a ways, maybe hopefully not too far. But, That's fine. you know, i from Colorado originally, grew up in, in the mountains there in Colorado. I think things that were, you know, I was always interested in the outdoors and in wildlife, fish, all the creatures are fascinated by that. So I ended up going to school in wildlife biology at Colorado State University uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s. I was also working on a ranch at that same time. I don't come from a ranch background, but as things kind of transpired in life, then that was, I'm mentioning these because they were really formative in the way that I, I look at, the, at, at everything. Uh, and then I, uh, when I finished at Colorado State University, I decided to go back to the ranch and I worked there, ran the ranch for, for a couple of years. And uh, I got really, during that time, was just thinking about what to do, what should I do with my, with my life? And I, I found that I was dwelling on research and I didn't know a thing about it, but thought that that would really be an interesting path. So I applied different places, ended up at Utah State University where I did my master's and PhD work and then ended up there on the faculty for, you know, 35 years. So that was it and really interested in the relationship between really plants and herbivores. How do they interact with one another? And then that's broadened out to the linkages of soils, plants, herbivores, human beings that I think you're interested in. But, but what you know what the focus of my career was really on how learning influences food and habitat selection by animals of any sort and uh you know if you up till the time we got involved it was more of a descriptive process i would say in many many disciplines describing what do animals eat where do they go when you move away from description to trying to understand processes. What are the processes that underlie why animals eat the foods they do? Why do they go the places they go? Then it starts to generalize across all species, if that makes sense. It, it becomes not something that's unique to a goat or a sheep or a cow or an elk or a bison or whatever creature you're interested in. It becomes those processes really, um, really are general. And you know, depending where you want to go, I can take a minute just to describe the three major processes we got involved with and how that relates into human food selection, nutrition, and health. 
Yeah, let's let's. What are the? Can you give us an overview of the three, and then we can kind of delve into them? And yeah, then and then you can go wherever you want. Sure, so, sure. So there were, um, from the standpoint of, of food selection specifically, to start off with, um, one of the things that was most surprising to me, and I'll skip a lot of the background on how we got there, but is this whole notion of palatability. What is palatability and uh, Back in the days when we were starting to work on that, 40 some, 45 years ago now, you know, it was a, it was a poorly defined term. Uh, depending which literature you looked in, people talked about it in different ways. Uh, often it focused on taste. And for instance, if I were to ask you why you like a particular food, odds are you would tell me because it tastes good. The taste and odor are pleasant to you. If I asked you why you don't like a, a particular food, you would say, well, I just don't, you know, I don't like the flavor of that food. And that's true. That's absolutely true. But what we did so many studies on over the years, hundreds of them, was to let us to realize that palatability is more than a matter of taste. It involves feedback. And that feedback is coming from cells and organ systems in relationship with the what I refer to as primary compounds, that would be energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins, and these secondary compounds, these broad array of compounds that plants produce, these hundreds to tens of thousands of compounds. So it's, it's complex interrelationships, but over and over and over again, when we worked with primary compounds, secondary compounds, interactions amongst those compounds, and we looked at feedback, and uh, it was just clear that feedback alters liking for the flavor of food as a function of need. So it's very much dependent upon the nutritional state that the animal is in, and whether the food is pleasant or not pleasant, uh, you know, it's it really gets linked to that. Does that make some sense? Um, you know, I, I mean, we spent 40 years, and when we were first doing the studies where we would offer food in different flavors, and we would put nutrients or, or something in excess directly into the gut of the animals or into the, into the circulatory system, and you would see tremendous changes in liking for the flavor of the same food in different flavors. It, it twisted my mind at first to realize that, hey, we put this thing in directly into the gut after an animal eats this for instance, straw, I have a video I like to show of straw, which isn't a great food, and it could make sheep absolutely love that. I often think of that in relation to processed food. You know, you follow eating processed food with an energy boost, which is what that's doing, and all of a sudden your liking goes through this. Or if you follow that with, with an excess of any particular compound, you can markedly, de we learned how to make very strong food aversions or very strong food preferences. And feedback was, was driving that. So I'm, that, that was just, it was mind boggling. Um, it, it, it um, I think changed the way not only we, but, but people in the disciplines we were publishing in, uh, Totally looked at that. So, so feedback is one part of it. The second thing that we studied so much is the availability of alternative foods. What are the alternatives that the animal has um, out there in the environment? Absolutely essential to nutritional wisdom being expressed. If there are very few alternatives, um, then the ability of the body to express what it's capable of doing relation, in relation to meeting nutritional needs, as well as in relation to self-medication. Animals, we showed over and over again, animals can self-medicate for a variety of different ailments if, if they have the alternatives. And that leads to the third part, is having good models to learn from. The whole idea of learning and mother becomes absolutely fundamental to that. Um, Young animals begin to learn while they're still in the womb. Fetal taste systems fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. So the flavor of foods that mother is eating are getting into the amniotic fluid and already the young fetus is starting to learn what's food and what's not food. After birth, flavors that are in uh, <clears throat> mother's diet get into the milk. And that relates to some of what we'll probably talk about, how these flavors are transferred. That's getting into, into the milk. 
again, cues for what's food for the young animal. And then mother as a model of what and what not to, to eat. And then more generally, where and where not to go in terms of habitat selection, what's a predator, what's not a predator. All these things are being learned. So there's three, basically three processes that we studied for 45 years that are all related to this notion of the wisdom of the body and uh, linkages then of, that ultimately go from soil to plants and plant diversity through herbivores and then scale up to, to human food selection, nutrition, and uh, how, what, you know, what's happening in the environment with the animals that we eat is influencing the meat and dairy that uh, are produced. So that's long-winded, uh, Sean, but that's just trying to give some background on where, you know, on where we came from over the years related to this topic. We had a, a fellow on him, you may know him, uh, Glenn Alzinga from Alder Spring Ranch. And I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he's up in Idaho and he's losing his, he runs, I guess he's got 500 head running on, I can't remember how many acres up in the, up in the sort of mountains of Idaho. And he's got a very diverse uh, selection of plants that they, they, they eat. It's not just they're only eating grass or silage or hay, hay or whatever. Uh, they're eating flowers and whatever. I mean, because we, we, you know, we kind of assume, you know, there's assumption that, you know, all cows eat grass and they should only eat grass and grass is what they should eat and they should never eat anything else. What are, I mean, what is a wild ruminant animal supposed to eat? I mean, what, are, what how much variety that should they have in the diet? Could they have in the diet? I mean, is, is it, is there a way to optimize that? Just let them, let them loose in the environment, let them eat what they want. How do we, how do we get them to eat the, the food that's going to make them the healthiest, and I guess the assumption, this is an, and this is an assumption because I, I really want to see the data you have on this, that a cow that eats its native diet or, or goat or sheep or whatever, whatever we are consuming as secondary consumers, is that going to translate into healthier nutrition for you and I? Because that's a question that I think is an important question to answer. So how do, how do animals eat, you know, if you just let them to their own devices, what do they do? Yes, but perfect question. Uh, I'll step back and say, yes, I know Glenn Elzinga very, very well. We work closely with him. The shepherding practices that he's using, the in-herding that he talks about, actually that came uh, when he read a book that I co-authored with, uh, with a colleague in France, Michel Mireille, who spent his lifetime studying shepherding practices with sheep, goats, and cattle, how the shepherds... Um, move animals across landscapes in ways so that it maximizes diversity in their diets, getting back to your question. So, you know, when they look at a landscape, and uh, as I look out this window here, I can see different, what we refer to as habitat types, different kinds of vegetation that are across that landscape. Some we know are animals prefer to others. What's beautiful about what the shepherds do is they think about how do we create complementarities, and I'd like to go there as we talk, complementarities amongst different foods in that environment so that animals don't just eat the best and leave the rest, but so that they eat all of the foods in the environment. Now, more specifically to your question, you know, that's one of the things I, I most was interested in during my years in the ranch, during my years at, Utah, at Colorado State University, and then subsequently is, you know, food selection by animals. And I spent a huge amount of time simply watching animals on diverse landscapes. And here's a generalization that, that fits everything that I ever watched, whatever creature it was. Animals within a meal will typically have three to five foods as the bulk of the meal. But on a landscape that has, say, 100, 150, 200 plants, it's nothing for them to include 50, 75 different species in their diet during the meal. They take a bite of this, a bite of that. And, um, you know, back in those early days, I used to think, well, all of us used to focus on the primary dietary items as the ones that were important. I don't think that way anymore at all, Sean. I think about you know, this diverse array of other species with all these different chemistries. Now, when you get into the chemistry of these plants, they all have different, even if they go by the same names, this plant has tannins, that plant has tannins. The structure and the way that those tannins function in the body are all different. I mean, you think of these broad classes of compounds, the phenolics, the terpenes, the alkaloids, each with tens of thousands. 
And to me, what I think about all the time now is from a prophylactic standpoint, when cells and organ systems, including the microbiome, are being given access to all of these compounds. I often think of cells and I think of capillaries and I think, you know, a cell can only forage on what's in those capillaries. Well, if they're being exposed to this broad array of compounds because animals are eating this huge array of compounds, that leads to health and it's a therapeutic way. And we know that animals given many, many choices um, are, are healthy animals. You, on the other hand, when you can find them, you restrict their diets. For instance, what happens in feedlots, um, you know, we have to make up for that confinement, that lack of choice when they're fed this, what's referred to as total mixed ration, which offers no choice for individuals, basically, formulated for the average individual in the, in the herd. Why then you know, there's, it leads to a lot of, of illness and uh, we make up, we counter that with antibiotics and so forth. But, you know, animals eat a diverse array of plants and your, your comment it took me back 45, 50 years for sure because there was this old sense in the nutritional ecology, uh, people who studied that, cows eat grass, sheep eat forbs, which are these flowering, <laughs> flowering plants, goats eat shrubs. That's such a misnomer, such an absolute misnomer. They all eat a really diverse array of plant species and learning is, is fundamental to, to how diverse their diets are and to how they learn to mix and match things um, without wearing it out. And I, I mention this because it's someplace I think we can go as we get into the human part more. You know, animals learn to, to use certain plants as appetizers that help them to utilize other plants as main course species. It's kind of the essence of where the French uh, shepherds have gone. But um, for instance, out here in this part of the, the world, there, there's plants called sagebrush that's dominant over the Great Basin. It's a, it's a very, very important plant species. Um, it's high in terpenes. They set a limit on how much uh, any species can eat of that, wild or domestic. But there are animals that have figured out that if they eat a plant that occurs with that bitter brush, if they eat a little bit of bitter brush as an appetizer, they can eat more sagebrush. And so far as we know, we don't need to wear out this kind of biochemistry stuff, but tannins in bitter brush form complexes with terpenes in sagebrush, and so they prevent them being digested and absorbed. They end up in the feces instead, and so the animals don't have the adverse effect set as quickly with a combination of bitter brush and sagebrush as with, with others. Well, why do I mention that? Um, you know, in, the, in one of the papers we wrote, Is Grass-Fed Meat and Dairy Better for Human and Environmental Health? we're talking about, in a way, complementarities and how herbs and spices that are added to meats, uh, how a glass of red wine with polyphenols can counter alleged adverse effects uh, that people talk about related to meat. So all of that has to do with processes and with um, sequences and complementarities and how they influence, can influence food selection, nutrition, and health. Is that making sense? Yeah, no, it does. I want to ask you, um, so animals like, they, I mean, cows or goats can eat stuff I can't. I mean, there's, I mean, and I'm not just saying grass because of the, uh, uh, you know, high silica contents and stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's reasons why humans can't eat grass. I mean, but there are compounds that they, they if they're eating a hundred varieties of food and, you know, obviously there's, there's foods out there that make animals sick too, but they, they, they routinely will eat compounds that would make me sick due to inherent toxicities in those plants and I don't have the ability to, to, to deal with that. So when they eat these foods, maybe it's glycoalkaloids or something like that, you know, in, in high con relatively high concentrations or high amounts, yeah. how much of that ends up in the meat and does that have an impact on me? Because this is an argument about pesticides and gly glyphosate and what is, the, what is the animal's capacity to detoxify, how much of it ends up in the meat itself? Because I think that's an important thing to understand is that you know, they're sprayed on pesticides, there's natural pesticides, the, the, the ruminant has to deal with all that, uh, that we don't. And so how much are they able to filter that? Is there this biomagnification that occurs? You know, we hear about heavy metals in fish or, or animals eating, you know, 
whatever, you know, pesticide or some toxic compound as in biomagnifying in their fat tissue, for instance? Yes, that to me, that's the, that's the million dollar question. The article that we wrote and was published in Frontiers in, in Nutrition on grass fed meat and dairy, that's the, it was really a hypothesis that we put together. We, we pulled together as much circumstantial evidence as we could and we, we were waving our arms and saying, look, this is probably really important. In the past, we focused on ratios of omega-3s to omega-6s and we've, uh, <clears throat> people have pointed out that when animals are on high grain diets and feedlots, that ratio, you know, high amount of omega-6 relative to omega-3. When they're on forage diets, that ratio is, is much lower and CLAs. And we were saying, okay, we, we know that and so forth, but there's this, what you're raising, there's this diverse array of compounds. Many of them are fat soluble. They're getting into, into, into the body of the animals. We don't know much about that, but we should be looking at, at that. That was really what, what we were saying. So um, we, we tried to pull together evidence there of compounds that, that get into, into the fat and meat and into dairy. Uh, we sense, and I'm happy to share this with you too, if you, uh, it's, it's been submitted, but we've since done a more thorough review of, uh, I'm working, and this is a good point to, uh, to mention this. Uh, I'm working with two people that I should say, I'm more working with that. They're, they're taking the lead role. I want to get this. One is Stefan Van Vliet at Duke University, who's incredibly interested in this. He's a young, um, very bright researcher that really wants to, I think, spend the next 10 years or more. I, I've told him you could make a career out of this, Stefan, really, of, of, of doing not only metabolomics kind of, of trials, which we, we bet he's been doing, to compare um, the phytochemical and biochemical diversity of meats that are coming from different sources, but then clinical trials. And we corresponded just a little bit about that and some of the challenges of that. But um, so Stefan is, is really taking a lead role and Scott Kronberg, another colleague at USDA ARS in Mandan, North Dakota. I specifically want to mention them because they're, they're really, you know, I'm kind of a cheerleader. I, I've been trying to encourage encourage the work and, and been co-authoring papers and proposals with them, but they're, and especially Stefan Scott's near the end of his career, we'd, we'd love to see this taken on because as we pointed out in that article, there's enough evidence already to, to argue that grass-fed isn't grass-fed isn't grass-fed. The diets that the animal's on are going to influence um, undoubtedly the meat and dairy products that come from that. This, there's a review, as I mentioned, that and a subsequent one to the paper I wrote that's, that we've submitted that really uh, explores that even more and points out even more the, the biochemistry of some of that and what's in the fat and meat. But um, our thought is that first to explore that and start to explore it in more of a systematic way, and that's where I could see easily 10 to 20 years of of studies of really looking at at what's happening there, and then um, you know getting into the clinical trials. What what really uh, interested me? Let me step back just a little bit, if that's okay. And uh, so we'd done forty some years of research on these processes, and and I'd thought about humans over and over again, but I, I hadn't tried to get into the literature. When I retired, I spent the next ten years just reading, reading, reading and trying to say, okay, we studied these kind of processes, what's known in the human literature? What, and then uh, putting that into this book, Nourishment, that, that I, I wrote. And uh, one of the studies that was really striking to me was done in Australia. And what they were doing was comparing meat from cattle that had been uh, finished in feedlots versus kangaroos that were out on rangelands eating these really diverse diets. And it was a clinical trial, short-term trial, where they, would, <clears throat> they uh, would offer people either meat from cattle or meat from the kangaroos, and then look at 
inflammatory responses, post what they refer to as postprandial inflammatory responses, responses following the meal. And it was a crossover design, so people ended up eating both, both meats during the trial. It was just striking to me the increase in inflammatory markers following a meal of cattle versus the kangaroos. So I wrote to, to the, the, uh, the scientists and I asked them, you know, obviously animal and diet are confounded. Are you going to do a study, say, with cattle that are f same breed from, you know, one eating feedlot, one out there on, on these diverse diets? And they said, no, we're not. And they said, our point is really, if you want to eat meat in Australia, you should be eating kangaroo meat. Don't eat meat that's coming from feedlots. And uh, in Australia, we, I lived there for a year on a sabbatical with my family. It's a fact that when you go into the, into the supermarket stores, there's kangaroo meat there on the shelves as well as, as livestock. And they said, that, that's it. So ever since then, I've just thought, you know, this would really be an interesting and important area to start to explore. Um, and now with, with, with Stefan there at Duke and uh, his, uh, all of his contacts, it's really an opportunity. And, and I think he's fully intent on on doing many, many studies. And I'm more than happy to try to help in whatever way I can as a cheerleader related to that. But we've got like four or five, as you, you know, four or five articles that have been submitted related to some of that, some of the, some of the preliminary studies and then some of the reviews. Hey, Fred, just as like kind of a follow-up to some of that, because th I'm really interested in this too, especially after having Glenn Elzinga on the show and him talking about just the wide diversity of plants that you know, his cattle have access to. And even, it was cool just even hearing him talk about how if you follow them closely enough, you'd see them actually kind of sniff out certain types during certain times and things like that. So they, they definitely seem to have like this intuitive sense to you kind of, to back to what you said in the beginning, go after those things that they're, they're craving for a reason. Do we know, like, let's say like if we fast forwarded a few years or a decade or whatever, we find out like your research and uh, some of Stefan's hopefully upcoming uh, research will uh, points to like, okay, we now know that like certain ruminants, these are like in terms of diversity need like these groups of things to, to produce like ideal outcomes. Is that something we could potentially just supplement in with their feed too? Or is this something that is almost kind of so complex that you almost have to let them just go find it and do it themselves? You know, certainly um, a person could provide provide supplements. Um, I think the logistics of that could, you know, it, it could be a challenge, but, um, you know, I've talked to people in feedlots and, and talked about some of our work and talked about these plants that, that provide um, health, not only in the primary compounds, but all these secondary compounds and help animals prophylactically as well as therapeutically. But the logistics gets to be really, I think, gets to be a challenge. That's where it seems like to me, the uh, this whole uh, movement and involvement in in pasture reared animals, the kind of thing that Glenn does, um, is is really a, a a good way to go. Not only for the health of the the animals and presumably the 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 product, the meat and dairy that comes from that but also for what can be done environmentally related to the health of soil, uh, plants, the whole business of climate change and fixing carbon, as well as, you know, the diets that they're eating. If, if there's a diverse array of plants, and I mentioned tannins earlier, tannins um, <clears throat> are really important in terms of reducing methane emissions. So these secondary compounds without wearing that out or trying to go into detail on all of them, they're playing really important roles in the health of soil and organic matter and how recalcitrant that organic matter is to breaking down how long carbon is, stays in soils. Um, they're also playing really important roles in terms of, of emissions and how quickly animals are able to, to grow and so forth. So multiple, multiple benefits there. Uh, and I, I know I digressed from your question, but hopefully I, I, I made that clear. And, you know, then when it comes to pasture species and intercropping and those things, 
then we can start to think of the reverse arrays of uh, plants that we can plant. And uh, you know, like Gabe Brown and, and, and other folks are doing nowadays, diverse arrays of plants that can be planted that are, are you know, I often say soil is, is so such a hot topic nowadays and for good reason. But I, I like to always point out plants turn dirt into soil and diverse arrays of plants turn soil into homes, multiple homes for herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores, both below ground and above ground. So diversity becomes so fundamental to creating nutrition centers and pharmacies for vast arrays of creatures below and above ground both. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes perfect sense. And my, my question was kind of intentionally narrow in scope because I was going to have a follow-up one about what you just kind of touched on. So you didn't really digress. You just preempted my secondary question, which is yeah, okay, good. How, how does like, because I can see that as being like kind of, okay, let's get a quick fix going here. And like your research could be used for that intentionally to say, okay, we don't have to change nearly as much if we just throw this into the feed and then there we go. But then, then it doesn't necessarily address all these other arms of kind of the process that you mentioned, like the soil health to just kind of returning these these animals to to kind of more along the lines of where they're naturally going to be behaving and living out their lives and all that other stuff that kind of gets roped in once you kind of go down that rabbit hole a little bit. So it's it, it's very interesting stuff. Absolutely the case. And uh, your comment makes me think of another thing and a change in my, my way of thinking over the years. Um, you know, when you're saying you know, maybe we can just formulate a ration that has these things in it and so forth and so on. To me, it makes me think of what's been such a single factor kind of focus often in, in research. And not only, I mean, it's been any, it's happened in ecology, even though ecology is, is really thinks about, you know, multiple interdependencies, but we, we, we did a lot of single, you know, which compound in plant X is deterring animals from eating a particular food or causing them to eat a particular food. In human literature, it's just incredible, the focus on individual compounds, you know, compound X, Y, Z, whatever it is, whether it's a supplement or whatever it is. I've moved so far away from that in my thinking over the years. Um, when, when you come to realize in plants as they're growing, the, the literally hundreds to thousands of compounds that they're creating, and then you think of a diet that has 50 or 75 foods, it does not lend itself anymore to reductionist approach or to even thinking about individual compounds. You start to think about the tremendous uh, complexity that's involved here. And in my mind, you reach a point where you finally, um, you finally just say and appreciate that there's these higher order, tremendously higher order interactions and the body and cells and organ systems know what to do with that. And uh, that it, it simply does not lend itself to reductionist approach for experimental analysis. And so you start to think, and I've always appreciated the French shepherds this way too. They don't focus on individual plants they think about combinations of plants and what combinations and how do you work across the landscape? That's what I'm trying to say with this too is I think the emphasis on individual compounds and are you getting enough of vitamin D or vitamin whatever it is or this much secondary compound misses the point. And I don't know if you want me, to go, but your comment and where you were setting me up makes me think very much about that, about these complex um, the complexity of it all. And, you know, if it goes back to where I started, if animals have uh, diverse arrays of choices, if they've been lo become locally adapted to those landscapes across generations as a result of learning from mother and grandmother and great grandmother, you know, that's really what wildlife populations end up doing. They become very locally adapted. And there's so many things that they end up learning about how to use those uh, environments. I mentioned, for instance, an appetizer of bitter brush helps the sagebrush go down. Very few animals actually have figured that out, but certain groups of animals figured that out. And so that becomes a part of the local culture. And over and over and over again in my career, that's what I observed is these local 
local cultural kind of things. We, we often focus on, in livestock anyway, our genetics. And certainly that's, that's an important part, you know, the breeds and the animals you have. But what we tried to emphasize was this whole role of learning and epigenetics, gene expression, as a function of what animals are experiencing in the environment as being fundamental to being becoming locally adapted and really learning how, how to use, use an environment. So form, function, you know, anatomy, physiology, behavior become intimately linked and transgenerationally linked and to me, it's then become, you know, what's it mean to be locally adapted to the landscapes that animals inhabit? And so there's all these linkages and interdependencies mm -hmm. that get tied into that. And, uh, you know, in reading about what we've done uh, <clears throat> with our diets and, and some of our own behaviors, I think we've really... Um, We've really separated ourselves from the environments we, we inhabit as a peoples. I think of, of some of the old people I knew when I was a youngster who had come over from Europe. They still brought many of their traditions with them on how to cook, uh, on slow cooking and, and wonderful kinds of flavors of herbs and spices, growing their own gardens, um, raising their own chickens and bees and a few creatures around and we've just totally, you know, those are linkages to, to, to a landscape in a way. And we, I think we've really gotten away from that as, as a peoples. This episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by Bioptimizer's Breakthrough Magnesium. Magnesium is responsible for powering over 300 critical reactions, including detoxification, fat metabolism, energy, even digestion is influenced by the presence of magnesium. It has been estimated that up to 80% of the population may be deficient in magnesium. Often people don't recognize that there are at least seven types of magnesium. Most magnesium supplements contain one or two forms of these seven types. Bioptimizers has formulated their magnesium supplement to contain all seven forms of magnesium. Breakthrough Magnesium has a select packages available for up to 40% off when combined with our custom 10% discount code, which will be activated by entering the coupon code HUMAN10 when you head over to www.magbreakthrough.com forward slash human. All links and codes will be included in the show notes. Now, on to the next topic. Yeah, you know, I had one more follow-up question along that that you kind of uh, touched on a bit that I've been thinking about because, like, if we would just, like, fast forward again uh, and just envision this kind of, like, regenerative utopia, so to speak, where, like, we're, we're providing, you know, a vast amount or the majority or all the meat from these regenerative processes, I think, like, when people think of just, like, land mass in general, they look around and they think to themselves, well, there's plenty of open space that we can't develop or don't develop that these ruminants can go on and, and feed off of and, uh, and grow. And, you know, you have basically a renewable, a renewable resource, more or less. So my question within that is, are we kind of, or am I in any way, getting ahead of myself thinking that we can kind of do that with our current livestock, agricultural kind of crop, I guess you'd say, or is this something where we would need to really diversify the types of meats that we would eat in order to kind of match the environment with the proper animal? Because, you know, it's one thing to say, well, we could throw a bunch of cows out on this, uh, you know, this desert or a bunch of cows out on this like mountainous landscape. And it's another thing to think, well, the cows don't necessarily match the plants out there, but maybe goats do, maybe sheep do in, in Australia, kangaroos do kind of that sort of thinking. Or am I uh, underestimating the nutrient availability in all these landscapes? No, I think you're. I think what you're saying and what you're alluding to is right on target uh, with that, Zach. Um, certainly, you know the discipline that that I was in for so long, wildlife biology, and what's referred to as range science, is so much about those kind of interrelationships that you were describing. And certainly some landscapes are more suited to certain creatures that, than other kind of landscapes. Um, 
Goats will eat grasses, they'll eat forbs, but they also will eat a large amount of browse. And in terms of their body size and their anatomy and phys other anatomy and physiology, they have characteristics that naturally enable them to do that. Um, there's some species that a goat can eat that a sheep can't eat, for instance, because as, as Sean was talking about toxicities of certain compounds, um, and there's some that, that uh, sheep can eat that cows can't, and vice versa across the board. So, you know, um, these complementarities amongst different species, having combination in some environments, maybe you, you don't have certain species because they don't do so well there. Um, and that raises this whole point also of chickens and ducks and geese and, and rabbits and, you know, wide arrays of different potential um, animals that be, can be raised on landscapes as well. So now having said that, and I, uh, you know, I'm absolutely with you on that point. It's certain that, um, you know, I'm thinking of, of a paper that I read probably 30 35 years ago, Desert Ranching in Nevada. It's called Desert Ranching in Nevada. And the, the author of that paper, who was a, a rancher, was pointing out all the adaptations that his cattle had undergone to live in those environments. When I worked in Southern Utah, um, on some of the lands that I, I these blackbrush dominated landscapes, that I used to wonder how on earth can the goats even make it down here in the winter? And those ranchers told me, you wait till you start working with our cattle. You're going to be blown away. They put their heads down and they browse uh, like, like a goat. And, but the, their body size, their anatomy, their physiology, everything they've learned from uh, conception on is helping them to be locally adapted to those landscapes. So does that make sense? It, it can be both things. And certainly... A goat isn't a cow, isn't a sheep, isn't an elk, isn't a bison. That's acknowledging that there's differences amongst those species. But it's also trying to say um, there are, there's a lot of flexibility within a species to become locally adapted. Is that uh, confusing maybe, enough? <laughs> no, that was, that was great. I think uh, we're, we're digging in on a few things that I think we've, I mean, we've had a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but we've had a, a number of kind of regenerative as well as just kind of conventional agriculture folks come on the show. So it is always interesting to kind of hear the different, the different angles and explanations with all that. Hey, Fred, I want to, I want to really delve into this topic. I know you talked about the difference between the kangaroo and the cattle in Australia. And like I said, my sort of real, I mean, I, I have a lot of people that eat a lot of meat in their diet. And so we're concerned about the quality of the meat. We're concerned about the impact that it might have on human health. Uh, we, we have a study with Harvard University that's going to look at, assess humans and see what happens when you eat a bunch of meat in your diet. You know, my experience is generally pretty good things happen. But when you, what, how do we get to a point where we can say cows that are fed this way, you know, let's say, let's say the Glen Elzingo grape variety, regenerative style versus the majority of the cattle in the U.S., which, you know, it's, it's feedlot, you know, type finish. What do we need to do to say this one is better for human health? This one is worse for human health? I know, I mean, obviously you can look at the what's in the meat. You know, there's CLA, there's omega-3, omega-6. But those, those things, honestly, I mean, we just, we can't say that is clearly unconfounded leading to better health because we don't know that. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the nice thing about these people that eat a lot of meat is they're, they're pretty unconfounded by the rest of their diet. Uh, there's actually people out there that only eat meat now, which is kind of a crazy thing. Uh, as you may see, but I mean, there's a lot, there's thousands of them doing it now. So these guys are the perfect test subjects for this sort of, does the regeneratively finished wide ver variety diversity meat versus, you know, kind of a, you know, the, the, the total mixed ration, you know, standard meat uh, feed make a difference. So we're, I know you're looking at inflammation, you know, some people would say that, does that mean anything? Does, does inflammation, you know, is it, is it going to get rid of my diabetes if, if I have a post Cranial inflammation is it is it good is it bad exercises cause inflammation i mean when do we get to the point where we can do let's do a six-month trial where we got you know group a eating the feedlot beef and group b eating the glen elzinga beef when's that going to happen and we can say uh, what's going to help you know that's that's exactly sean and i i let me 
back up and say, I very much appreciate the question that you're asking. And as I've thought about it, and this is more what I'm going to say, brainstorm, you know, throwing out ideas. I, it makes me think of when I was starting my career and thinking about learning and trying to think about, well, how, how are we going to approach this? And, and all I knew was that this is an important topic and I'm going to spend a lifetime studying this. I'm going to, and I'm going to go wherever it takes me and try to really have a holistic view. And that's the way I look at this. And that's why uh, in the conversations with Stefan, and I, I think he's really uh, just running and gunning. It's uh, trying to look long term and to think about. And I appreciate what, what you're saying. Because I thought, you know, we can do all these laboratory analyses and we can look for that individual compounds and we we've decided to try to use metabolomics so we can look at broad arrays of compounds and this first paper that we submitted to JAMA that it looks like will in revised form will be accepted that there were very good very very constructive kind of comments that about that paper and just implications that were very much the kind of thought process that we have. But uh, it seems to me, and this is as much a question for you too, a uh, chance to brainstorm, that trying to work with, with whole animals, with whole human beings, where the body is the integrator, and then trying to think about what, what are the things that we can measure uh, over longer term trials and really get some handle on, on, on what's happening, uh, using the body as an integrator rather than focusing on individual compounds and so forth. And, tr and sure, inflammation uh, is, is perhaps one, certainly one thing that, that could be looked at, but I would say trying to, and I think uh, Stefan and, and certainly Scott are on board of trying to get many people involved and, and certainly Stefan has many there at Duke and folks like you involved in brainstorming about, well, you know, what are some ways to enter into this? One of the things that, that has struck me too, and you alluded to this in, in an email, you know, related to design. Well, what are you going to design? And I, I, I for sure want to say, I don't see it as one study. When I, we were starting our work, I told this professor, my major professor, I said, I really want to study learning. He said, yeah, you know, well, maybe you could do one nice study that rules out genetics first. <laughs> well, we did 40 years of, of work, you know, all related to, to learning. So that's how, how I view this. But then I, I think about, you know, what would be some initial really interesting designs that you could use that are simple enough so that you don't get overwhelmed when you start to, to try to do it with people. And... Uh, you know, over and over again in our work, basal diet, the diet, the kind of the background diet the animals were on became so important in terms of what any outcome was. And so, you know, I think what if a person is on the highly processed Western kind of diet versus a person that's on, on whole food, wholesome kind of diet. And then, so those two backgrounds, and then looking at response to Glen Elzinga meat versus feedlot meat. I, my mind starts to think in terms of, of relatively simple designs and then what kind of responses would you measure? But I, I think that's, you raised the key question and that article was, was posted as a hypothesis article to say, look, this is, this is probably really important. We need to at the very least start to discriminate that meat isn't meat isn't meat and dairy isn't dairy isn't dairy, that the, the 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 diets the animals are on are going to influence that and it's going to go beyond omega-3s and CLAs and and so forth. So does that <laughs> give, give a little bit of, uh, of some thoughts? I think we might have lost Sean for a second there. Mm, I think we did. He, <laughs> he looks frozen. frozen. <laughs> he was like, I, I've not, I haven't seen him be that stoic yet. So <laughs> no, either the answer was so terrible. He's just <laughs> putting me in stone. For... <laughs> He'll probably. No, it's a very that <laughs> that's you know I mean that's the key question that that he's asking relative to these trials and where do we want to go from there and uh, and I just what 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 we need Zach is funding. 
Mm -hmm. we, that's, and we're submitting proposals after proposals after proposals, but it all remains, you know, hypothetical and, and to me very interesting. But until you can start to, to actually do some trials and start mm -hmm. to see where it's going to lead, is there, you know, what, what, are, what does it tell us? about any of this that that's the next step and maybe um you know you have to always be open to sometimes things you're thinking don't work out the way you're thinking at all they mm -hmm. absolutely don't and so then you you go where where the findings take you you don't try to fudge that you just say okay we were thinking this but there that we're learning this so we're going to go down this path that's certainly what we did throughout the years and it became you know, it's kind of like an elephant, like the elephant in the room and, and nobody's, everybody's blind and you try, but you know, if you can feel around on that elephant for, for a long time, yeah, I think you start to get a little bit better sense of, uh, than you would if you do, like I was saying, one study and you say, well, this is, this is it. That's not enough to tell you too much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you about that when you mentioned, I hadn't thought of this, but, uh, with the, in regards to the funding side of things is like, a lot of times I feel like what I see personally is once there's consumer demand for something, now all of a sudden there's reason for some of these uh, companies that have the capital to like get the funding put in place starts just happening. I think the most recent example within the regenerative movement that I saw was when uh, Will Harris's White Oak Pastures was one of the primary suppliers for uh, um, what was the, the company that got bought by Nestle, I think. Um, uh, shoot, I'm blanking. But anyway, they got bought by Nestle and they were using, they were using claims of our, our beef is regenerative. It's a zero carbon or something like that. And Nestle was a little, I mean, I suppose their legal department was a little hesitant to be putting that on, on their labels. So they sent over, a, they, they did like an $80,000 study on his to just kind of confirm whether they could say that about his particular system over there. So it's like, I feel like that's kind of an example maybe of the funding getting there because of consumer demand, like had that company not grown uh, to the point where they were selling enough for Nestle to get interested, then Nestle is not going to pony up the $80,000 probably to put that study in place. Is that something you're seeing more of, or do you feel we're kind of like on a point where that could break through at some, at some point in the near future? No, I think you're right in, in what you're saying about, you know, as consumers, become aware of and interested and and thinking something's worthwhile i think that that ripples through the system and uh, we'll see what happens we're we've submitted many many proposals at this point to different mainly um you know governmental kind of sources we haven't gone so much to really uh, approaching private industry or that but um it's always interesting to see what kind of reviews you get with the proposals because that's reflecting um, how people are thinking about this. And to be honest with you, this whole topic that we're, we're raising relative to um, phytochemical and biochemical complexity of meat as a function of diet and its implications for human health hasn't been yeah, you look in the epidemiological literature, meat is meat is meat, and a lot of the studies are, are negative relative to that. And uh, so I, I don't think this has is, is been much on the radar screen. And certainly we're through the reviews that we're writing and uh, trying to get that to a level of awareness that, that there's probably something here. And... Uh, so that's where I see that it isn't just a pro ex an exercise in getting one more paper in a journal, which I could care less about at this point, but a, a process of saying, look, this is probably something that's really important that's been overlooked. We should, we should, uh, we should have a look at that. And so those, those papers we're writing, I think, are valuable in that sense of, of pulling together all the evidence that we can for to make the case and then saying, you know, as, as um, Sean, when he was with us, say, you know, <laughs> we need to go to, to some well thought out clinical trials and, and start to try to do the best we can to understand the implications for health over a longer time period as well. And certainly that's in the proposals that we're writing. Short term, kangaroo 
versus cattle kind of studies, as well as longer term clinical trials. We're, we're proposing all of that. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Hopefully we get the funding and down the road you can have Stefan and Scott on and talking, Stefan talking about all the findings that he's getting there with, uh, with colleagues at Duke and so forth. Yeah, no, we, I mean, we'd love to have those guys on. I think, uh, you know, the, every time we have someone on in this kind of topic area, it just, I feel like we answer a few questions that we didn't quite get through or to the bottom of with the previous guest that had some knowledge about it. But then like, you know, there's always like, you know, there's always another one that pops up then or another few that pop up. And then if you, if you're willing to think beyond what we can do now or are doing now or know now, then it starts, you get guys like Stefan, I guess, who have probably this map in their mind of like where they want to be in 10 years with this topic. And, uh, no, absolutely. I think that that's the case. And he's, he's, uh, as I said, um, young, very bright, just go getter all over the literature, totally on top of, uh, of this. And, and his interest in the topic comes not, not because we suggested that that this should be a top his interest is is genuine from the the ground up in fact he we went with Stefan to Glen Elzinga's place and and spent a couple of days last year looking around at uh, at what Glenn's doing I, I've known Glenn for many years now and uh, but that was a great chance to take Stefan over there and, and try to get him looking at, at what we're, we're really talking about. What's that mean for a diverse diet and watching cattle forage and, and looking at different ways that people manage cattle. Glenn is, is at, a, as a, at the highest level. Uh, to me, what shepherds do and what Glenn is, is doing that, that the shepherds do is the most nuanced approach possible to, to managing animals on landscapes. And what you can do then for the health of those landscapes becomes incredible. Well, not everybody does that, honestly. And so as we drove up to the place, we were able to show, well, here's a way that, that um, many people manage where they just bring the cattle up here, they leave them, they'll come you know, every couple of weeks and, and move them to a new pasture. And um, so there's, there, there, grazing isn't grazing isn't grazing, how you manage grazing, varies tremendously and what's possible then if we're willing to develop relationships with the environments that we inhabit and we have the the ability to do uh, what Glenn's doing uh, there's just so much possibility for health health from the ground up including our health mm -hmm. yeah no I think uh I think it's it's an interesting field, and I'm glad that you and as and and the kind of younger generation is is taking interest in it. Because I think, especially when you get to like the PhD level, uh, I have so much respect for everyone who goes through that process. As someone who hasn't myself, just like you, I mean, it's got to be a topic you really love at the end of the day because you're going to be spending you know more hours than you can count diving into very very kind of tiny topic areas and you know, big topic areas, but ultimately probably smaller ones, just so you can have the time to actually drive anything out of it. And then you hope your, your partners within the same kind of umbrella are, are doing the same on their perspective side of it. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely, it becomes absolutely consuming. And it's not because a person has to, it's because you're just so mm -hmm. totally into it that uh, you end up eat, sleep, drink, think that's kind of, yeah, it really yeah. becomes your, your life in many ways. <laughs> Maybe more than it should be, actually, but yeah. it, it's certainly <laughs> consuming. <laughs> All right. Well, Fred, thank you so much for taking some time out to come on the show and kind of share your expertise and stuff like that. And you know, we'd definitely love to stay in touch with you as if you had come up with something you want to chat about, we'd love to have you back on or if some of your colleagues that you know are interested in kind of sharing something that they've come up with. Uh, uh, definitely keep us in the loop. But um, if you have uh, any specific websites or social media channels that you use that you'd like to share so our listeners can find you, we'd be happy to share those now and put them on the show notes as well. Okay. Um, you know, and I'll, se I'll send you a couple of links as well, a link to okay. this grass-fed meat and dairy paper. Um, you know, when the last 10 years of my career at Utah State University, we had a program called Behave, and there's a, still a website, behave.net, that's kind of a repository of all the many, uh, all the work that we'd done during 
up to that point and uh, uh, lots of user-friendly fact sheets, um, videos, and so forth that really describes, gives a great overview of all the, all the processes. So those are, I'll, I'll send you links to both of those things. Perfect. No, that'd be great. I think our, there'll, we'll, there'll definitely be some of our listeners who want to follow up on that. So <laughs> that'll be good to have those in there. Awesome. Well, Fred, thank you again for taking some time and coming on. I'll let Sean know. I'm guessing his computer did a restart or something, but uh, I'll let him know that uh, uh, that things ended well and that uh, we were grateful to have you on. Yes. Well, get to you, Zach, and to Sean as well, um, I very much enjoy the opportunity to be here with you to, to spend some time. I will keep in mind and send you some ideas on other folks that uh, might be interested, you might be interested in having on as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, you bet you. Take care. Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.